uh, it is composed of two parts, basically. Uh, the first part is introduction to Rancier. Uh, we, we talked with Rasa that it would be useful, uh, despite the fact that you already are uh, experts in Rancier, uh, uh, despite all the, you know, your knowledge, um, uh, I, I would introduce a few main concepts that may be pertinent and uh, that may, might be useful for you to have in mind while reading um, the text that you were given, uh, Future of the Image and Emancipated Spectator, uh, to have those ideas in mind. And uh, the second part, so excuse my banality uh, in, in the beginning, so you, you might know everything, but it's also related to the second part, which is my take on Rancier and uh, the interrelation of these ideas with the philosophy of imagination in, and the concept of imagination, which I'm elaborating now. I'm looking for alternative forms of imagination. And, uh, and I find Rancier uh, inspiring here as well. OK, so um, um, I shall start with. Uh, with uh, Rancière's thinking. Uh, as you all know very well, um, for Rancière, uh, aesthetics uh, is uh, something different, uh, a different concept, different notion uh, than we have uh, this concept in, in, in uh, traditional philosophy. Um, for example, it, the concept was introduced, uh, as we know it, uh, by uh, Alexander Gottlieb Baumgarten, a German philosopher, who, who used it in a different sense than, for example, uh, Greeks used. You know? Because aesthesis, it's a uh, you know, central empirical perception uh, for, for, uh, for the meaning of the word, uh, while uh, Baumgarten started to use it as a, as a word indicating philosophy of art uh, or taste or of a, of a theory of beauty. So uh, then Kant has, uh, Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, has this conflict with, with Baumgarten and, and he kind of tried to argue, uh, telling that you know it's not a proper word because in his critique of pure reason he used this term uh, uh, in, 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 to indicate uh, the a priori forms of our perception of sensible and intuition, namely to indicate time and space. Uh, time and space for Kant was a priori forms of perception of our subjective uh, constellation. So Rancier kind of uh, gets uh, in the middle of this dis discussion and uses the, the term of aesthetics uh, in a Kantian sense, but also uh, in, in, in the Greek sense. Uh, so for him, as, of course, aesthetics is uh, the sensibility, some, something sensible, but also something uh, uh, pertaining to time and space, uh, but not exactly in a Kantian uh, uh, sense, but um, uh, introducing the level of political. So uh, time and space for Rancière is uh, uh, related to the distribution uh, of uh, subjectivity and political participation. So time and space is always political for Rancière. I would quote, politics consists of, this is from Rancière, uh, uh, politics consists of uh, reconfiguring the distribution of the sensible that defines the common of the community by introducing into it subjects and new objects, in rendering visible those who were not, and of making understood as speakers those who were only as understood as noisy animals. Uh, you will find uh, in the emancipated spectator as well. Um, and in many different uh, writings by Rancière, uh, the description of Gabriel Goni, uh, the uh, labor worker from 19th century, uh, from 19th century. Uh, and this um, is 
kind of uh, the case of Gabriel Goni is uh, um, something that uh, encapsulates the idea of um, uh, of Rancière's take on, 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 on the aesthetics and, and on the intersection between aesthetical and political thinking. So Rancière um, started uh, as a political thinker. He was the, um, the student, Althusser student, and he contributed to, to the studies of capital uh, by Marx. And, and after that, he also had a conflict with, with Althusser, but um, he, he spent quite a while um, studying um, 19th century uh, workers' archives, their diaries and their, um, and their memories, uh, the description of, of their fight, uh, and, and uh, so on. And um, this is here uh, where he discovered the case of Gabriel Goni. Uh, which kind of embodies the uh, distinct form of aesthetic and political action. Uh, so what is the case of Capriel Goni, which is a very specific thing also for, for, my, uh, for my research, because it, it, it has to do with imagination as well. So Goni worked days laying floors in 19th century in uh, bourgeois interiors and spent his off hours composing a system of principles designed to convert his modest lifestyle into the maximum freedom. But sometimes, by means of imagination, he would transport himself into alternative spaces. So he kind of disconnects himself and, and goes, you know, wandering around in his imagination. So once here, was astonished by that, because, you know, in all the Marxist tradition, we have this uh, adoration of uh, labor, of, uh, of working, you know, and, uh, and uh, um, somehow he, he found out that, that labor, uh, that these people were disgusted by labor in a way, and they, 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 they were trying to, f to find alternatives for uh, the time spent while working. So for <laughs> Francier, Gouni's description of the moment of reverie on the job uh, approximates, approximates one of the central experiences codified by aesthetics. Uh, I would quote uh, Goni's diary. He speaks, uh, you, you can find this quote in the An Emancipated Spectator as well. And he speaks uh, of himself uh, uh, in the third person. So this is uh, Goni speaking of himself, but as if he was uh, another person. So uh, this is the quote. Believing himself at home, he loves the arrangement of a room so long as he has to uh, not finish laying the floor. In the window, if the window, sorry, opens out onto a garden or commands uh, a view of a picturesque horizon, he stops his arms and glides in imagination toward the spacious view to enjoy it better than the owners of a neighboring res uh, residence. So um, what uh, really uh, interested um, uh, Rancière in this case is uh, this moment of detachment of your uh, activity. So uh, of, of uh, also preordinated uh, system of uh, duties, for example, of what, call, what he calls distributions uh, of the sensible, of meanings, of identities. Uh, in a way, imagination helps you to detach yourself from uh, what is prescribed as your identity. Uh, and uh, kind of recreate your identity to find uh, yourself uh, in a new body and new world. In the Nights of Labor, uh, one of the books by uh, by Rancier, uh, one finds the description of workers engaged in the constant struggle over redefinition of their capacity. So he kind of studied many of them, and um, and he um, uh, he was astonished by this discovery. So these stories help to reveal that our senses, uh, and this is also a very important thing. Our senses, our empirical capacities, function in tune with imagination. Uh, Goni himself indicates that it is this capacity 
imagination, uh, central to the aesthetic tradition as well, to Kant, to Baumgarten, uh, and, and to many others, which sets the process in motion. Uh, and here we, we come across with the very, a very important concept of uh, Ranciere's thinking, which is uh, distribution of the sensible. Uh, these archival texts uh, uh, chart the remarkable history of workers who refused to partition their lives according to the dictates of work and, th and thus their strict identities as workers. Uh, they kind of, they did not simple, uh, simply struggled, uh, uh, simply struggled, but they founded journals, composed poetry, and imitated bourgeois forms of aesthetic contemplation. So instead of um, uh, finding in manual work uh, a source of pride, they kind of uh, described it as a torment. And at the same time, they used their knives to engage in creative and scholarly pursuits. So uh, uh, for Rancière, this is a, uh, a rebellious moment of, uh, uh, of what uh, is a constellation of our sensible uh, setup, of our distribution of sensible. Uh, we, we, uh, we are not sensing the world. We are not experiencing the world naturally. So the senses are not presupposed to be a, a natural thing. They, they are always formed and distributed, and they're based on partition. Uh, and in his later work, which is uh, dedicated to, to analysis of Plato's philosophy and, and uh, the harsh critique of, of philosophy uh, in Plato, um, I would remind you, he, he kind of uh, criticizes uh, this um, aristocratic structure of society um, composed of three uh, caste-like parts. Uh, I mean, Rancière criticizes Pla Plato um, and kind of sees the, this constellation of society um, as the background for the concept of distribution of the sensible. So I would remind you a few things from Plato. Um, in, in Republic, we find uh, those three groups of people, uh, philosophers kings as a ruling class, and they do have, according to Plato, souls of gold, which is uh, the main illusion, according to Rancière. Uh, the second group would be soldiers, uh, who, who's got uh, the soul of silver, and the rest of the people, they have, um, they are workers and they have bronze or, or iron souls. So, uh, uh, as you see, uh, what we have here is uh, the distribution of nature, which functions through, uh, at the same time, through the distribution of, fun uh, of uh, our activities. Philosophers are born to rule. So they sense the world in a different way. Uh, soldiers are auxiliaries of ruling class. So we, they support philosophers. So the, their sensible world is based on training and uh, increasing their, uh, fostering their fighting capacities. And the rest of, uh, of the people, they, they, they're workers. And, and, and they conceive the world in uh, uh, differently. So uh, according to, uh, to, to Rancière, uh, this distribution, hierarchical distribution, is not only political, but it's also, in a way, uh, sensible, statical. And it is not accidental that um, Plato uh, expels poets from the society, from the structure of the society. He uh, wants artists to go away, according to uh, to, to, to Republic. Um, they should be banished from ideal states. Uh, why? Because poetry is a very dangerous thing. As you know, uh, we have this triple structure, ontological structure, in, in, in Plato's thinking. There, there is a transcendence of uh, ideas, uh, the, the, the reality itself, the forms uh, uh, and the ideas. Then we have objects that are copies of the ideas, 
So this is our empirical well. And then we have uh, uh, the things produced by artists, so the copies of the copies, the copies of the things, uh, so appearances of the appearances, uh, which are located twice away from truth. So according to Rancière, uh, this uh, description of ideal society uh, is the, gives the background for uh, the distribution of the sensible. Plato expels those practices uh, and distributions that would content its account on, on the social. Uh, uh, sorry, but would contest its account uh, uh, on, of the social. So according to Rancière, um, philosopher, um, Plato's philosopher, uh, is not afraid of, of uh, iron men, of workers. But he's afraid of poets. He's afraid of poets uh, uh, as they can change this distribution. They can uh, introduce something uh, which uh, does not respect the, the, the setup he, he, he uh, wanted to introduce. So um, in, in this, philosophy reveals itself as a means of interpreting sense that refuses to acknowledge the fundamental separation of sense from itself. Uh, what Rancière uh, uh, terms uh, the census. Uh, philosophers, the ruling class, want uh, the meaning, the sense, to be a single and, and stable thing. Uh, and this census of the sense, uh, the interruption of the sense, uh, is kind of um, the space, the opening uh, for a different kind of, kind of community, for a different kind of experience. So this is the preliminary um, remark to, uh, to understand what we uh, what we deal with when we speak of this census. Uh, basically, uh, this census starts with a disidentification. Uh, Rancière describes aesthetics as a means of disidentification, opposing of different kinds of sociologists introduced by Plato, but also Kant and Schiller and, and different uh, philosophers. So reframing the space-time of the occupation uh, of, of your duties. Uh, uh, workers, these workers described in, in, in the archives he studied, rejected the most common partition of time. The partition uh, according to which workers would work during the day and would rest during the night. So this is the basic partition uh, applied not only to, to workers, to, to all of us, uh, which kind of uh, gives a background for our constellation of the sensible. We, we are supposed to sleep at night, not to, to go out. And, and uh, we are not supposed to, to dream too much. Uh, we are supposed to work. So the whole reconfiguration of partition of experience involves a process of uh, disidentification. So you, you, uh, you are not uh, doing what you are prescribed to do. You, you are you're rejecting your identity by experiencing it in a different way, by changing, shifting your sens sensible setup, the setup of, of the sensible. Um, and it also has to do uh, with the uh, shifted relation to the speech, visibility, and so on. Uh, thus, Uh, aesthetics and art in general, for here, appears to be as something that conducts us into in the term in the terminate zone, uh, where there are no uh, preconstituted <coughs> class or, or um, other kind of, of um, uh, structures. So it. 
there is no normativity, and we'll get back to this later. Uh, uh, there is no uh, uh, structure to be in tune with. We, we, uh, and the census is mainly, uh, uh, is mainly uh, aiming to, to destroy this, these setups of, uh, of pre-constituted structures. Uh, so it, aesthetics neutralizes the properties uh, that are thought to be the part of natural setup of our body. So it's kind of, uh, uh, it introduces the clash into the nature of, of human body. Uh, and uh, transports into uh, a world where these distributions of places, times, and capacities are not permanently, permanently fixed. Uh, it allows sensible to be separated from the distribution of the sensible. Uh, uh, okay. So, uh, summarizing, uh, the dissensus in, in its essence is the activity of exposing and activating the breach within the sensible. Uh, the interruption within the sensible. So the census, both in political activism and in arts, is the means by which the sensible is deprived of the self-evidence. And it is punctuated, subjected to dispute. Um, as Rancière explains it, uh, the sensible is always once removed from itself, meaning that it never assumes a stable configuration or a single direction. Uh, it fragments community by making visible what previ previously went unseen. It, it has to do something with also Kantian concept of, of schematism, because according to Kant, we have perceptual schemes uh, uh, which help us uh, to uh, kind of to unify the manifold of our empirical uh, into something which is understandable for intellect. So, and this is the process of imagination, basically. Imagination creates schemes uh, uh, in order to make our empirical world uh, perceivable. So these schemes, and this is where also uh, the critique by Adorno is, uh, is introduced. Adorno criticizes industrial schematism uh, uh, as, as a mean uh, which is ruled by Hollywood and, and pop culture and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, our perception is always modeled uh, by certain schemes, by certain uh, uh, patterns, which presumably, uh, in our mind, are supposed to be natural, but they are not. They are formed. So we uh, perceive through our senses um, by applying those patterns. And uh, sometimes they're stereotypized. They're really, uh, not sometimes, always, they're stereotypized. And we always have to, to deal with uh, finding the, the, the point of breakup in them in order to uh, emancipate ourselves. So it usually what you consider as a natural setup of, of your set senses is preformed uh, culturally, politically, and uh, basically this is what for us here is the distribution of the sensible. And the senses, the senses fragments uh, uh, this constellation by kind of introducing the tension into, our, into the field of our senses. Uh, and this is how we can see what previously uh, went unseen. Because when we uh, apply uh, the schemes of our perception, usually we, we are not able to notice uh, the things uh, that uh, does not fit into the framework, framework of our scheme, the framework of, of the distribution of a, of a sensible. So partage du sensible, you know, the distribution of the sensible, uh, is, is, is a word um, uh, which, well, it's, it's a French expression of a distribution of the sensible, uh, and uh, it is, is the expression that has dual meaning also. We have to, uh, uh, to pay attention here, because uh, 
on the one hand, uh, it is based on, on partition, on distribution, but on the other hand, it's always about sharing out the sensible world with others. So uh, it is the division and uh, community uh, and sharing. It, it's always the same process, the same thing. We share the world as long as it is separated. And you find this analysis also in the em Emancipated Spectator and, and in the future of the image as well. It's, it's a very important point. So the community of the things that are separated, that do not constitute the same identity. Uh, uh, the, uh, the portage is based on the divisions and interruptions. It's, it's the, the basic premise. Uh, the dissensus with insensible patterns allows to address this way what is silence, invisible, alien, but can be shared out at the same time. So uh, the distribution of a sensible is the system of divisions that assign parts, supplies, meanings, and defines relationships between things in the common world. Uh, one such part belongs to art, which uh, the larger distribution prescribing how the art uh, as relate to other ways of doing and making. And this is where we come uh, across with the concept of the regime of art, also a very important concept in Rancia. <clears throat> uh, the regime of art, the very notion of the regime of art, uh, is not exactly a historical concept. Uh, it is rather the practical or conceptual uh, network um, that helps to define uh, art and situate it with the respect of more general sphere of appearances. There are three regimes of art. You, you know this thing, I, I presume, but, uh, but I would repeat that. Uh, ethical, representative, and aesthetic. And the three regimes do not correspond strictly to temporal periods, as I said, although they kind of have certain historical moments uh, central to their formation of, uh, of each. Uh, a regime is not a time frame, but a series of axioms that arrange art and position it in relation to other practices. So <clears throat> what are these regimes? The ethical regime of art uh, stems from Plato's Republic. So it is uh, the continuation of a critique of uh, imitation. As you know, uh, Plato is not fond of, of, of the activity of poets. Uh, um, we, we've already mentioned that. And um, uh, basically, uh, why uh, there is a problem for Plato uh, uh, there? Uh, is that um, images are measured in a normative way by something that is not image. So there is an ethical take on that. Um, for Plato, um, only those practices that support or undermine the hierarchies of souls uh, or, or polis or, or, or social structure are valid. Uh, so when we measure, uh, uh, we measure uh, images, we see that they do not correspond to the reality of ideas, and they are really ontologically, uh, ontologically uh, corrupted, uh, illusionary. We measure them according to the, their ontological status. Uh, on the other hand. Uh, they have a bad impact on our souls, uh, on uh, the nature of our souls. Uh, uh, so we kind of, they stimulate our desires and our emotions. So uh, uh, it is the bad thing for rationality, according to Plato. So we judge images ethically in this case. We judge images according to what uh, effect they have or what kind of ontological status uh, is uh, at stake here. Uh, the representative regime of art uh, was developed from the principles of uh, Aristotle's poetics. Uh, 
it, it inaugurates a few things that are also important in the future of image. For example, the relationship between the uh, visible, uh, visible uh, sayable and visible, the interaction between language and image. But the visibility, especially visibility of a theater in this case, because um, as you know, Aristotle speaks of, uh, of um, a narration of the plot, uh, and, and which is pertinent to, to the tragedy and comedy and so on and so stuff. Uh, so the, the visibility of the theater and other uh, arts in the representative regime is um, basically reserved for transmission of speech. Uh, so logos is dominating here. The speech, the language, the narrativity uh, takes over the image. Um, it is uh, defined through uh, the relationship between mimesis and po uh, mimesis, uh, w w understood as the relationship between poesis and isis. So, uh, in the representative regime, mimesis, uh, the, the mimetic gesture, uh, functions as a uh, transmission of uh, poesis, the creative power. Uh, of, of the artist uh, to the effect that it uh, creates to the aesthesis of the, of the spectator, of the perceiver. So aesthesis uh, uh, is uh, ruled by mimetical structure. Uh, the, the transmission between these two fields uh, happens uh, through mimetical structures. So based on, uh, on the narrative, the representative regime aims to basically to convey the story, the message, successfully. Uh, uh, it has to, uh, to tell something. And images serve in order to tell something. Um, and also the other thing is that a certain normativity is also pertinent here. The normativity of genre and uh, the normativity of uh, uh, appropriate representation. For example, when we read a critic review uh, on theater, on cinema, on, on art, it usually has to do something with representative regime, with the normativity of representative regime. So, uh, whether Brad Pitt is a good actor, uh, you judge it by a certain norm. Is he, you know, uh, acting? Uh, and his acting convinces you, yes, okay, so uh, we judge um, it according to the norms of, of, uh, of representative regime. Uh, so there is a certain autonomy of art. We don't, um, we don't um, use ethical approach here. We don't say, okay, the, uh, it is bad to, to see Hollywood movies because uh, it corrupts your soul. Uh, as an ethical regime, but uh, uh, but uh, there is a certain uh, <coughs> normativity at the same time because uh, if 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 an actor is not good enough, uh, uh, so nobody goes to see his performance. Um, it's a different kind. It's it's a normativity which is autonomous of the ontology uh, of the world uh, be, uh, beyond the art. Okay, here comes the aesthetic regime of art, uh, which endeavors to abolish all types of normativities, and especially the normativity of representative regime. As uh, Rancière puts it, it is the rupture of the concordance of sense and sense supplied by the framework of representation. Um, I would quote from, from Rencia. Aesthetics above, above all means that very collapse. In the first instance, it means the rupture of the harmony that enabled correspondence between the texture of the work and its efficacy, end quote. So basically, when we enter the, the aesthetical regime, uh, we don't have any coordinates uh, what it has to be. 
So it's a constant attempt to reinterpret what makes art or what art makes. Uh, the art is art, paradoxically, uh, only when it is more than art in a static regime. Because it does not correspond to uh, none of the canonical structures of norms or whatever. We don't know what is art. And this is the promise of emancipation. Uh, so this is what also art offers to, to the political field, the promise of emancipation, the promise of leaving your uh, political setup of the distribution of the sensible, and what helps you to, to transform um, your into other form of life, forces the transformation of, uh, into a, uh, a form of life as well. It has to do with life, something. Uh, the art in a, in, a, in a statical regime has to do with art, uh, with life, sorry. <clears throat> okay. These were um, uh, the preliminary remarks on the uh, Ranciere thinking, and now I would go to the second part of my presentation, although the time limitation is very severe, uh, which is about imagination and montage, and which has to do more uh, about the text. Uh, Rancière does not speak about imagination a lot. For him, it is not an important concept, whereas for me it is. <laughs> so um, I, I kind of... Um, uh, I want to introduce a few ideas from different authors in order to show how uh, Rancière's ideas could be helpful in developing the new kind of uh, uh, the concept of imagination, which I'm keen on doing. So I would start uh, with a few, uh, few remarks on, on uh, Pietro Montani, who is a contemporary uh, Italian philosopher and who wrote a book which is called Intermedial Imagination, eh, Immaginazione Intermediale. Uh, he's not a very famous thinker, but I, I suppose he, he uh, contributed a lot in, uh, in, into uh, thinking on imagination in the technological age. So what is intermedial imagination and, and, and uh, why it is pertinent here? Uh, basically, he conceives imagination as a technique uh, directed towards technology. So it is uh, uh, not uh, a natural thing, in a way. Uh, and this is a very post-Deridian, post-Stieglerian, uh, uh, or whatever uh, uh, kind of thing. Um, when technology uh, kind of uh, precedes uh, language, for example, in David Danio, uh, language precedes uh, the voice. Uh, the written text precedes uh, what you conceive as a natural or interior quality. So uh, for, for, for Pietro Montani, uh, imagination is, is not something as your uh, capacity, uh, as, as, as your faculty of a soul, for, for example. But it, it is a technique and technique is always um, the double thing. It, it is your own technique, but it's always uh, shared out as well with the world that surrounds you. So intermediate imagination, uh, according to Montani, re-realizes the world through refiguration, authentication, and recreation. Uh, that is by exploiting the mediated access to its maximum. We don't have a natural access to the, to the world these days. We are in the media world. You know, all the McLuhan thing is at stake here as well, or Baudrillard or whatever. Uh, we, we, we cannot access the world directly. It is mediated. But according to Rancière, um, the, it seems that imagination itself is a medium. It is not that when we imagine, we kind of only detach 
uh, from ourselves and go something somewhere into the realm of reverie or whatever. But it, it, it functions uh, uh, continuously whenever we feel the sensible world and whenever we have uh, uh, the, the technological images uh, in front of us as a mediator or intermediator. So uh, by exploiting the situation to the maximum, by um, using uh, and understanding uh, having the consciousness of, of the imagination of this kind, uh, we kind of um, have an, an, a chance, an opportunity to intercept this uh, uh, play of different media formats and to establish the critical space for it, uh, not by accessing the real world beyond images or beyond media formats or whatever, but by creating clashes of images uh, and uh, fostering the tension that shows us the traces of, of the world behind the images or intrinsically existent world in the images. So the creativity here is uh, of a negative type. And this has to do something with the concept of imagination that was already present in Kant. Uh, you know, for Kant, imagination is something productive. As he puts it in uh, uh, the critique of, uh, uh, of um, mm, pure reason, um, imagination functions as, a, as a, the synthesis of the sensorial manifold. So we don't perceive the world directly, we perceive it through imagination which unites all the data into something stable. We see objects uh, as um, mm, synthetic structures which uh, are performed by the function of Im imagination. And this is where the schematism appears, the schemes uh, help us to, to create those synth synthetic structures and so on and so forth. But in the critique of, uh, of judgment, in his late work on aesthetics, on the philosophy of art, uh, he proposes a, a different kind of imagination, which is uh, um, a very specific function, which was outlined in the analytic of the sublime. Uh, uh, we experience sublime when our imagination fails to comprehend the greatness of natural events uh, by means of determining concept of understanding. Basically, um, we, when we experience sublime, we don't find a proper image for our experience. But imagination is still functioning here. It, it intensifies our experience. And of course, there is uh, the reason which helps us to interpret our experience, uh, and this is how the problem is solved. But, uh, uh, and imagination is kind of fails here. It's uh, the, the, the situation of the failure of imagination, uh, of its inability to, to grasp forms or to produce forms. But at the same time, uh, this failure of imagination indicates uh, its highest intensity. So when imagination fails, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It works at its highest extent. In a way, it starts working uh, as an iconoclastic power. Uh, it starts functioning as something, uh, as a negative creativity, which aims not to, ex for example, to escape media. And uh, obviously, Montani uses this concept uh, by Kant and uh, introduces in, into his thought. And um, um, he understands the intermediate imagination as something relevant to, to the negative imagination of the analytics of the sublime. So 
uh, in this case, imagination uh, helps to destroy the uh, illusionary and referential nature uh, of representation. Uh, remediating, reduplicating the mediatic forms of representation and so on. In a way, it, it, it's, imagination, it's an, a case of imagination which helps to form a short circuit, uh, the collision in the media system, and uh, uh, to open up uh, the system to something other, to something different, to something beyond the system. Uh, in, in this case, um, by unchaining of uh, preconditioned pre perceptual schemata, the negative imagination, or sometimes they call it now in, 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 in recent theories, de-imagination, liberates the energy surplus and functions as a and intensification of the sensible. I would say we, we have a link with Rancière here. Uh, for for Rancière, um, uh, well, we remember um, the, the, the distribution of the sensible is something that should be uh, uh, laid aside, you know, in, for the for the new the redistribution of the sensible. So. I see it as a, as a link. Uh, I see it as a process of reimagining yourself. And uh, it was present also of, in Goni case, <clears throat> in the diary that we, we quoted in the beginning uh, of, the, of the French worker of the 19th century. Uh, the redistribution of a sensible uh, occurs through, uh, can occur through the negative, of, uh, through, through the negative imagination. Uh, what would be the concrete case? Uh, Montani gives uh, plenty of examples, uh, and one of his examples uh, is from Lars von Trier, Five Obstructions. You, you, you obviously know the film. Um, uh, it's, um, you know the film? Okay, uh, so I, I'll tell a few, a few things on that. Um, Lars von Trier um, offers Jorgen Lett a famous um, uh, director to make a remake of his film. Uh, he, he, sh he created uh, a very notorious and aesthetically uh, uh, important thing which is called the perfect human. And uh, it is a white and uh, black and white, uh, uh, black and white film. And there are images and, and, and voiceover in that film. And, um, and aesthetically, they are very attractive. Uh, but what Lars von Trier wants to introduce here is to uh, recreate uh, the same scenes in, in the different format. Uh, so he, he offers, for example, to make a cartoon uh, out of this or, or to go to uh, to India, uh, to Calcutta, to uh, remake this scene. I, I can show you the film later and during the uh, during some evening if you if you want. Uh, it, it's a very it's a very uh, famous example uh, of how to deal with uh, um, uh, with intermediate imagination in this case. And uh, this is Jorgen Lett in Calcutta, and he is uh, reinterpreting the scene of his own in, um, uh, in the most poor uh, neighborhood of Calcutta. Uh, he, he is having the fine dinner uh, with uh, lobsters or whatever, uh, and the best wine, uh, while uh, He's being observed by the local people um, who presumably uh, would earn uh, less uh, in a year than, than, you know, than one salad is worth, for example. So uh, uh, he kind of tries to uh, reduplicate the format, reduplicate the, the scene, but also to introduce uh, the ethical uh, ethical layer in all that, and according to to Montani, th uh, this way aesthetical imagination uh, is uh, 
exposed to, to an iconoclastic gesture. Yeah, we see a very beautiful image and we kind of remember beautiful images, but there is an ethical space in all that as well. So uh, there is a, 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 an ethical challenge. And when we confront these images of uh, the poorest neighborhood and um, uh, the aesthetic uh, fine dining scene, um, the clash occurs, a certain clash occurs. And this is mainly where uh, the negative imagination starts, in the field of the clash. Uh, so uh, getting back to, to, uh, to, to Rancière's thinking, um, uh, he uses, and this is the case of intermedial montage for Montani. So I would uh, compare intermediate montage with dialectical and symbolic montage we find in the future of image by Rancière. For Rancière, um, um, as you know, most probably, um, but these, uh, these types of montage, they, they are not about cinema. Uh, they are about the situations, uh, uh, the specific situation of image perception or art perception. Um, and, uh, for example, uh, dialectic is conceived as a chaotic power, as a confrontation, as a clash, uh, which emphasizes the machineries of the heterogeneous. And the symbolic uh, assembles uh, various elements as a mystery or analogy. Uh, and he uses plenty of examples. You can get back to this uh, uh, while reading. He uses, uh, for example, Godard's cinema a lot, like uh, his Duarte de Cinema. Um, but what is important here is that uh, in both cases, in, in dialectical and symbol symbolical montage, um, the, uh, there is no uh, synthesis uh, as in Kantian sense at stake. So there is no unification into something representative. But uh, the emphasis is on the measurement of uh, what is incommensurable. So of putting together the heterogeneous elements that cannot be unified into the structure uh, which has the same identity. Um, we can elaborate on that later because it's a, it's a very complex uh, uh, concept, but I, I think you will get back to this while reading, Terence here. But I want just to uh, uh, outline a few things. Um, and uh, uh, according to Rance here, the power uh, of sentence image, another concept you find in, in, the futures, uh, in the future of image, is extended between these poles of uh, dialectic, uh, dialectical and symbolical. So uh, between the clash that affects the division of system of measurement and the analogy which gives shape to the community. Uh, the interaction between an image that separates and the sentence that, you know, the sentence image, you remember the concept? I, I presume you, you read some things, because, so I'm, I'm going fast. Uh, the sentence image is also not an image, it's the situation of image uh, perception which strives for the unity, uh, but at the same time um, uh, for, for, for the unity of the phrasing, of uh, constructing certain constellations that have the unity. But at the same time, it is based on separations. So the separations do not disappear in, in the phrase image. In, in uh, the sentence image, in the Limage phrase. You know. So it's always about coupling the heterogeneous elements and constituting the community uh, through the rhythm, rather, but not through the substance. So you are, you are not uh, transforming the substance of the image into the other substance, uh, as in the representative regime, uh, uh, according to the hierarchy, preconstituted hierarchy, but you allow the differences, the heterogeneities, to remain and to be valid while forming a certain community uh, be between them, among them. And it is the community of rhythm, uh, basically. So 
But maybe the last thing I wanna I wanna tell you is uh, the concept of. Do I still have time? Yeah, because I wanted to show you uh, uh, a, a few scenes from from the film as well. So I'm not sure how uh, um, how much time do we have for the discussion. But anyway, uh, so the. Uh, uh, all this brings us to the concept of uh, incommensurability, uh, which is uh, present in the future of image. It's not, you know, one of those concepts that you uh, usually apply when you when you think of uh, of Rancière's philosophy, but I, I, I found it very very stimulating uh, because uh, he speaks of incommensurability um, uh, as something. Uh, that um, is pertinent to the whole tradition of, of the modern art and, and also postmodern art. Uh, and that's something that is uh, uh, the principle of uh, the aesthetic regime as well. Uh, what is incommensurability? It, it is uh, a kind of uh, disjunctive conjunction. Uh, you don't have the element uh, the unifying element to measure to other elements. So usually, in order to measure, you have a, you have to have a third part, the third element. Uh, and this is how all the representation works. You know, you you have a common background for for representation. Usually, it is the storyline or whatever, uh, the narrativity. But here, uh, there is no. Um, way to apply the narrative structure to measure what is at stake. Uh, but rather, um, what happens here is the community of the incommensurable. There is an Italian philosopher, um, a very interesting Italian philosopher, Gaetano Curazzi, who, who talks about incommensurable numbers in Greek philosophy. It has nothing to do with images. It has to do with Platonic philosophy, and, and uh, this Italian philosophy speaks of diagonal rationality, which is not the systematic rationality, because you, it cannot be uh, measured uh, by uh, the same means of the system, but can be understood only uh, escaping by escaping uh, the system into something that is incommensurable with uh, the systematic elements. So um, uh, I find this very inspiring uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, Rancière's thinking as well, as he speaks of incommensurability of images and incommensurability of the elements of art, uh, which is at stake when dialectical and symbolical montage is applied. So basically, it is when the incommensurability occurs. And uh, uh, it is, um, OK, I wanted to, to, to uh, tell you about a few other examples. But um, uh, it is namely the incommensurability of, um, of imagination that can be um, understood uh, as its core element uh, when we speak about intermedial or, uh, or negative imagination in this case. Um, why? Because uh, there are elements, there are structural elements which uh, function in the unity, which function in a certain uh, distribution of, of, of space but at the same time, uh, uh, they don't reduce their heterogeneity. And at the same time, they open up for something uh, that is other than, than uh, their identities. So there is a disruption into some novelty. So there is a creative nature in all that. And I, I, I wanted to give you an example of uh, uh, the imagination of the incommensurable uh, by talking about Miriam Lefkowitz. Uh, some of you might know her because he was, she was sorry, 
uh, present in, in, uh, in CAC and she was the part of Lithuanian Pavilion in Venice Biennale. Uh, she is uh, a French artist uh, who, uh, who is a choreographer, uh, uh, as a, I think she's a choreographer, and she, uh, she kind of does these blind works. So you, you, you close your eyes and she leads you through the city. Uh, being a personal guide. I did these works, I think, three times already in Venice, in Paris, and, and in Vilnius. And it's a very interesting um, experience of re redistribution of the sensible setup of the city you might know or, or not know. Um, uh, as she allows you to open your eyes in certain uh, moments, uh, and uh, it kind of functions as the reorientation of your senses. Um, for example, you can go to a certain space, open the eyes, and to see some, some strange, uh, um, I don't know, uh, expression of face. Uh, or then you can smell some laundry. Or then you can you know, uh, enter certain uh, uh, secret uh, place in the city which allows you to kind of uh, uh, rediscover the things that you, you've never saw in the city, and so on so, and so forth. So basically, you don't move according to the trajectories you know about the city, and you don't experience the city the way you are used to, but uh, you start uh, reimagining and re-discovering uh, mm, the city, uh, uh, through uh, the abolition of your sensible setup. You, you work with your eyes closed. So you, uh, there's an abstinence of perception in all that. And what happens here is the intensification of imagination and of your sensitivity as well. You become uh, way more open to, to, to the city. Um, so this is one example, and uh, uh, I also wanted uh, to, to show you uh, the beginning of the uh, post Denerix Lux, which is a film by uh, Carlos Rigados. Uh, you know the film? Yes. Yeah. He's a Mexican director. Uh, uh, he, he won uh, Cannes Festival uh, as the best director and also some other prizes uh, recently in 2012. And uh, he's got this special uh, take on, 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 on the images and on, on cinema making, filmmaking. Uh, uh, I think uh, this is the case where we can see the dialectical and symbolical montage uh, being applied at. Because he, uh, he kind of, uh, he he reduces the level of narrativity, although there is a story, uh, but it, it is not um, formed in a narrative way, uh, in, a, in a traditional uh, uh, plot, storyline way. And, and what he does, he kind of uh, extracts very strong images, uh, sounds. Uh, sometimes he uses special lenses to... Um, uh, transform the quality of the image. You will see if I'm not sure about the quality of this screen, but but uh, and projection. But uh, you, you can see that there are certain um, lenses being used uh, in in uh, in the images. So uh, he kind of w works with technological formats, uh, trying to find all those new uh, intensities between the image making uh, and. Uh, of forming the dialectical and symbolical relations within the image without using the montage in traditional sense as well. So uh, uh, this is the way I conceive uh, the relation between imagination and montage and uh, between what is the philosophy of imagination and Rancière thinking.